Welcome to the Health IQ Podcast. I'm Dr. Dustin Portella, board certified dermatologist, and today we're welcoming on Katie. Katie is a melanoma survivor. She was first diagnosed with melanoma all the way back in 2007, and she has been battling stage four melanoma, but has been cancer free for a number of years. I got in touch with Katie through Instagram and have been following her for a while because she has become a big advocate in the prevention of melanoma and education and advocacy for those who are also battling melanoma. We had a really excellent discussion where we talked about the things that she has learned along the way and we follow along with her journey. Thank you for listening to the podcast and if you'd like to support us, check out the podcast show notes or the YouTube video description to find links for companies that support us. Making a purchase through our Amazon links or on one of our affiliate links helps to support the show so that we can keep bringing you the kind of content that you'd like to see. Thank you for tuning in to the Health IQ podcast. Let's get into it. Katie, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Oh yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited so, to just learn more about you and just chit chat. It'll be fun. Yeah, I'm excited to learn about you as well and kind of the journey that you've been on because it's been mm -hmm. an eventful one and one you didn't necessarily sign up for. No, not at all. <laughs> So you are on social media as My Melanoma World, and that is because mm -hmm. you've had your own encounter with melanoma. When were you first diagnosed with melanoma? I was diagnosed in 2006. I was like 25, so just barely married. We had a little baby. I mean, it was like the start of my life. I was supposed to be doing all the fun things life had in store for me, but and that got twisted around. Yeah really quickly. Tell me about that first visit to the dermatologist. Was this a regular screening visit or did you have a particular lesion you were concerned about that took you into the office? I had my own spot that just showed up and it was kind of like a, people kept telling me, oh, you've got something on your arm. And it started to, at that point, I came kind of like a vein thing. I just felt like insecure about it. It's sick of people telling me about it. But I didn't go in right away because I just thought it was just part of my body. I didn't really know what it was at that point. But it started to itch and bleed. And it had all the signs of it just yelling at me to go into a dermatologist. And so after a certain period of time, I just knew that it was time to go in. And when I went to the doctor, I had my family and my little three-year-old toddler with me. And we were just like, Hey, we're going to get this done real quick. No big deal. When we got there, he, they automatically put me in the larger surgical room, which I felt a little alarming about, but I didn't, again, didn't know what skin cancer was. So I just sat in the chair and he looked at it right away and said, we're going to take this off. And I said, okay. And he's like, right now. And so I just was like thrown for a little bit of shock there. And he did, took the razor, scooped it right out. And I said, I'm going to take this for a biopsy. I'll let you know in about two weeks. And it took actually four oh, wow. weeks. Yeah. They sent it off for a second opinion. And then by the time they called me, I mean, I was just, at the time I was going to school to be a nurse. I was in the middle of schoolwork and I will really never forget that call. He just said, are you available to chit chat? And I said, of course. And he said, okay, I'm just want to let you know the pathology came back and it's stage 2A melanoma. And when I was at the doctor, he said the potential of it could be skin cancer. Here's kind of some information and pamphlets regarding what it could be. And I didn't read it because I just didn't know. Right. It was so like quick and vague. And then, yeah, he said stage 2A and, you know, we need to come in for a wide local excision and it kind of snowballed really quickly from there. So you had very little understanding of melanoma or skin cancer in general prior to that. It wasn't enough that you were losing sleep over waiting for these results, it sounds like. It was it was pretty tough waiting. I was a typical teenager doing the laying out and I'm very fair skinned. Being in Arizona, the sun is just inevitable, but I was not safe. I did not use sunscreen and Bless my dad. But at the time he used to say like, okay, guys, we're going to go to tanning beds. We're going on vacation. I want you to have a tan prior to like, yeah. he just didn't know. So we did some tanning, of course, too. So I did all the bad things I shouldn't have done. <laughs> <laughs> so time spent in tanning beds, certainly laying out in the hot Arizona sun, and then just not wearing sunscreen in your daily life or all things that all the increased red flags. your risk. Yeah. 
Now, what about your family oh, history? Did anybody else have a history of skin cancer that would have increased your risk? Actually, no, I was the first. I had uh, a red flag for the family. And then my dad is a very big golfer. And so he never wore hats and sunscreen, all the things he should be doing. So he actually ended up getting some basal cell. He had to actually get his entire face scraped off. Like Ooh. he looked like an entire different being, but he's been really good about keeping up with that. So I was actually the first you and of. the only actually. Good. Well, I'm glad it's the only at this point and set everybody else yeah. straight in the family. I want to revisit yeah. that phone call with your dermatologist where you're, you were told it was stage 2A. When we communicate mm -hmm. results to a patient, we often talk about the depth of the melanoma and depending on the depth of the melanoma in millimeters, will determine whether a wide local excision in the office is needed or if the person mm -hmm. needs to see a general surgeon or surgical oncologist in order to have a lymph node biopsy. Do you recall the depth mm -hmm. of your melanoma? And it sounds like it was not one that needed a lymph node biopsy at the time. It was nine millimeters in depth, at the, if I remember correctly. 9.0 or 0 0.9? 0 0.9, I believe. Okay. So almost one millimeter. Yeah, I could be wrong on that, but I did actually do a lymph node biopsy. Okay. And that was certainly something that I was curious about. So you mm -hmm. had an excision with a surgeon who also sampled a lymph node, presumably in the armpit, if this was on your arm. Yeah, they did the wide local excision. And then after that, he immediately said, like, we want to go in for a lymph node biopsy to just double check. But they ended up taking like seven lymph nodes to test at the time but they told me it was i was cancer free at that time so i was good for two years yeah so none of the lymph nodes showed any signs of melanoma okay that's none. certainly reassuring yeah but that wasn't the end of the story clearly because if anybody looks no. at your social media we know that you are a stage four melanoma mm -hmm. survivor and for right. the individuals watching or listening stage four means the cancer spread not only to regional lymph nodes, but at other areas in the body. And for melanoma, that can commonly be the lungs, the liver, the brain, anywhere else. So what happened two years later? This is what, I don't know, maybe you can enlighten me on this. I've kind of always had a theory on it, but I got pregnant with my second daughter and I was, I think it was like two weeks after her birth. I had a very large, like probably a pink size, ping pong ball size in my left armpit, which is the same arm of the original diagnosis. I always thought the hormones kind of kick-started some of that, what melanoma was in my body. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yeah, it certainly can contribute to a degree. We know that during pregnancy, your immune system goes through a lot of changes because mm -hmm. you have this foreign thing growing inside of you that's only half you and half somebody else. And so the immune system needs to make sure to protect you, but also not to reject this thing that is growing in you. So often the immune system in certain aspects is downregulated. And as a result, oh. we do see moles change frequency frequently in pregnancy, but that does not mean that most people who are pregnant will end up developing melanoma, but we often see moles right. change and it's not unheard of to see a skin cancer develop during pregnancy. And so the fact mm. that your first one happened after you'd had your first child may have had some relation, but it sounds like they were maybe three years old then. Um, yeah. But the changes that you go through in pregnancy may have lowered those the breaks on the immune system that were holding something back. It's speculative. Right. We can't say for sure, but it's plausible. Yeah, I kind of always put that. It was so quickly after mm -hmm. she was born. And the lump that I had, I mean, I could literally grab it. It was so large. And even then, I didn't think it was melanoma because I really just thought I was cancer-free mm -hmm. forever. I just was very naive to how melanoma grows and skin cancer in general. So I actually went to a breast oncologist first because I kind of thought it, it's possible to be that or a clogged mm -hmm. milk duct because she was so brand new. So right. that biopsy was done there. And uh, yeah, that came back stage three C at that mm -hmm. point. So it was in a lymph so, node. Yeah. That then probably signed you up for cat scans or pet scans. Yeah. I had tons of those and we actually took that tumor out. And so that, and this is, this for my story just gets a little weird. Cause at the time they said, we're going to do a lymph node dissection 
And so I was under the impression they were taking all of them. And so they, when I was done with that surgery, I didn't have a drain or anything, but obviously it was super sore. But at that point I was searching for an oncologist, Mm -hmm. like all over the state, trying to find somebody that would be able to take on my story. So I ended up at the Mayo Clinic, which Mm -hmm. um, I'm very lucky to have been part of their whole entire research team, but they were actually really surprised I didn't have a drain. So they ended up redoing that surgery twice, actually. Wow. Yeah. So the first time was to take out all the lymph nodes and they found extra melanoma in there. So I'm glad they took that out. And then I had to do it again for a third time to get into a clinical trial, which at that point was for Ipi Mumo Lab, which okay, we so- all use all the time now. Yeah, it's essentially standard of care now, but at that time, these Mm -hmm. immunotherapies were very new, and uh, I don't even know if they were FDA approved at that time. It may have been strictly clinical trial. It was only clinical trial. They didn't get them approved until 2011, so I was strictly running on this double-blinded clinical trial. It was the only and best option at that time because Mm -hmm. they basically were telling me, you have to take interferon or IL-2, which were very scary treatments at that time for me i was really terrified to be locked up in the hospital and just be away from my babies so we searched high and low for options yeah and for those watching or listening so interferon treatment or interleukin treatment are very broad treatments that amp up the immune system and try to get it to fight off things that are not good for the body that could be infection that could be cancer but because they're a very broad treatment they come with significant side effects But for a long time, it was about all we had. But patients often get Mm -hmm. chills, body aches, severe flu-like symptoms. And it's not a completely benign treatment in that it it can cause such a rapid immune activation that you can succumb even just to the treatment if things go awry. And that's not the common thing, but it's a risk. The immune therapies are much more targeted. They're specifically trying to get our immune cells to continue to activate and find the melanoma because most types of cancer, they are able to thrive because they find a way to hide from the immune system. And so these targeted immune therapies make that more difficult and they allow the immune system to continue to find and to fight those cancers, but they are not without their own host of side effects. And I don't know if you can touch on the side effects that you may have experienced while you were being treated with ipilimumab. So This double-blinded clinical trial, it was basically where the doctors nor the patient knew whether you were getting the treatment. And it was in Los Angeles or Santa Monica. So I traveled there every three and a half, four weeks. And it was, every time you went, you were doing scans, blood work. And if the scans came back with any melanoma at all, you were no longer part of that trial. I went for the, the third treatment And did my scans and found out that I had two tumors in my right lung. So I was then stage four at that point. This was about the summer of 2008. Okay. Just to give a time frame of where I'm at. And so at that point, Dr. Hamid, I don't know if you watch anything about him, but he's a great melanoma doctor. But he told me that it had spread and that I was no longer, I could no longer be a part of the trial. I was devastated at that point because I just felt that was my lifeline. We had to drive home and start over from scratch and figure out where we were going with stage four. So you'd previously been getting, did they let you know you were for sure on active drug in that trial? Later on, because they actually had to reveal it to get on a different treatment, Okay, but I ended up getting the placebo. Okay. So so you weren't on active drug in the trial? No, no. But certainly a heartbreaking moment. Now we kind Mm -hmm. of glanced over it, but I do want to ask when you had that series of three lymph node dissections, you also would have had CAT Mm -hmm. scans and PET scans at that time. And I'm assuming there were no nodules on the lungs or metastatic disease at that point. You were still stage three. Yeah, I was all clear everywhere else. Okay. You were eligible for the trial. And then later Mm -hmm. you were kicked out of the trial for developing metastatic disease. And then now we're into. Stage four, starting from scratch, Mm -hmm. where did you go from there? Well, we were, I mean, I was all about getting it out if possible. I was all for surgery. That was like my method of 
tree for me that was, it felt like it was the only thing I could control really, because everything was just spiraling at this point. So when they, when I got back home and we started talking to my oncologist, I, he was like, I spoke with this lung doctor and they're pretty positive they can get it out. We did a very severe lung surgery. It ended up taking like a third of my right lung. So that like this whole lung surgery is kind of a subject that I very rarely spoke of because it, that surgery, I almost died from it. I had, when I first woke up, the pain pump wasn't working. So I woke up in a state of like severe shock. I don't really remember most of it. My parents have just told me like how I just basically just slid to the bed of pain and I just kind of almost passed out. So once I got that fixed, I didn't really recover quickly. I developed really severe throbbing headaches. And so I was like in and out of consciousness kind of kept asking for pain meds. And so then they labeled me as a pain seeker because they felt (laughs) I was And so it was like I was battling that on top of just trying to recover. Right. This was supposed to be like a three day in and out surgery. But then I ended up being there for seven days and forcing myself to get up out of bed so I could try and start to get home. So I was like forcing my body to get moving, forcing myself to wake up and just kind of function. Right. But I think it was like day four of being in the hospital. This is what I don't remember. I called, my husband had been asleep next to me and I called my parents and just said, I'm dying. You need to help me. I'm dying. And I just hung up the phone. And so they raced over there and I guess my oxygen level was at like a 30%. Oh, wow. My body, my, I had no color in my face. My arms and hands were going white. Like, I don't remember any of mm-hmm. this. So I learned this like years later. So they quickly tried to fix the oxygen pump. And then I just kind of slowly recovered from that. But that was uh, my near death experience. And it was once I got moving and stuff, they told me later. And so I got out of the hospital with oxygen because I didn't recover properly. There was a lot of setbacks, as I told you. So it was a three month recovery from that. Wow. Yeah. So it just as an observation, the fact that they removed a good portion of your lung and then said, oh, she's a pain seeker, <laughs> right? She just wants narcotics is it's infuriating. Obviously yeah. we have problems with narcotics in the mm-hmm. U S medical system. And a lot of people do suffer from narcotic addictions, but it also, you know, the attitude can end up hurting patients that really need it. And it's, unfortunate yeah. that you had that experience of being labeled as somebody who was a narcotic seeker when you just had a portion of your lung removed and your ribs separated. and Right. And I was only asking them for Tylenol. I was just begging for something yeah. so I could recover from this headache because my oxygen level went so low and I was so dehydrated. It was just everything fighting against me and they yeah. just wouldn't give it to me. Yeah. And so when you're it in was, significant it was pain, you can't take a deep breath. And you need to to really be moving oxygen or your lungs are going to start to collapse and your oxygen goes low and it just one problem cycles into an, uh, it is so important to control pain. Yeah. So you're getting atelectasis here. Exactly. And my lung was like, as you said, collapsing and I had to do that breathing machine where you have to make the ball go up. And it was the most difficult thing I think I've ever done still to this day. Yeah. It's using that little machine. So tell me what you were feeling emotionally and mentally is you have stage four melanoma. You've gone through a horrific, painful surgery. You're struggling to recover. You have two children at home. It -hmm. would be hard not to find yourself in the depths of despair at times. What were you feeling and how did you get through it? The good part, I think, which is kind of sad, but the good part about it is I don't remember a lot of it, especially that surgery. But the one thing that I always did when I did a surgery is I took these little magnets of my kids and I put them on the little whiteboard that they write on every day, what the patient's doing, all this stuff. And so they were really my strength and my drive to move. 
even when that nurse was just like so mad at me, I wanted Tylenol. I was like, I'm going to prove her wrong. I'm going to get up out of this bed and I'm going to walk this. I literally remember looking at her saying like, what do you want from me? And she's like, you need to get up out of bed. So I got up and I walked and she's like, just to and from the door. And I'm like, no, I'm going to walk the entire floor and I'm going to do this and you're going to watch me do it. And so I did that. And so I feel like even when I was really low, I felt I needed to, no matter what, get home. Like I didn't care what I needed to do or how painful it was going to be for me that I would get home to my eight month old and my little four year old. Yeah, I was very low. It was very discouraging and I felt just targeted, even though they probably weren't and they were probably trying to do their job. But I never went on that surgical floor again. My oncologist made sure that I stayed away from that surgical yeah. floor. So they removed part of your lung. Presumably then they mm-hmm. got out the nodules that they had seen on the CAT scan. Yeah. You're finally at a point where you're functioning, you're off oxygen, and probably going back for additional scans. Where does the story take you next? Well, I in between all this, I'm trying different therapies. So I think at this point, I did six total, um, but I don't recall the actual order of which I did them. I probably have it somewhere, but right. after that, I think I was trying a Braxane at that, that point. And so we were doing that, or it might've been Leukine. I was doing one where it was like, I had to inject myself. That might've mm-hmm. been the Leukine. So at this point we were just trying to keep the melanoma at bay. I was do- keeping up with scans. And once I recovered from that, I got through most of fall in September, October, that kind of area. And then it was like in November, we always go out of town for Thanksgiving. So my husband is from Las Vegas. So we traveled to Las Vegas. It was like the second day in, we were at Thanksgiving dinner and I kept having these severe headaches, headaches I'd never felt before. Tylenol, nothing was touching it. Being in a dark room, putting a towel over my head taking 100, I think it was like 600 milligram ibuprofen. I was trying everything. So of course I called my oncologist, told him about the symptoms, what I was going through. And he's like, you need to come home right away. You need to come home, get to the ER and you need to get an MRI done of your brain. So we were there for three days. We left after Thanksgiving, drove home. And meanwhile, this headache has not gone away. I'm trying to keep little toddlers and babies quiet for this car ride. So it was a challenge getting home, (laughs) but we got home, we went to the ER and then the MRI showed a tumor in my brain at that point. And the swelling, I kept telling my husband, my, my brain feels like it's running out of room and the swelling took off like half of my brain. Wow. It was just, it looked like milk had just spilled in my brain. I think the, I think it was like 2.5 centimeter tumor. Yeah in my brain. So that was at that point, I felt like my life was over. Like I felt like this was it. So when you were having those headaches, did it occur to you before speaking to your oncologist that there might be melanoma there? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I always felt that I kind of knew when the melanoma was there or I felt it superficially. So it was kind of like mentally I was preparing myself for the worst. Yeah. And then my husband would be the positive, like, no, probably just a headache. You've been through a lot. He would always try to reassure me. We went back home that day, came back, saw my oncologist and he's like, okay. I'm like, I want it out. I want to do the surgery. I want it out if possible. Like I can't have that in my brain. I can't function. I was dropping stuff as well. Like Mm -hmm. my arm would just randomly drop things. I would say random things to my husband where he couldn't understand me. So I knew that it was progressively getting worse and very quickly. Yeah. So you so went they in were for brain surgery. To, I did. I have a scar across my head. That's probably the size of like a girl headband. It's yeah. like, I don't know, six inches. Probably they went in and got it. It was encapsulated, which means they were able to just scoop it out with mm-hmm. no little fingers coming out into good. the brain. So yeah, that was, I was very lucky with that. Yeah. Very good. And then we did a, radiation, got rid of all of the possibility of a reoccurrence. And I've never had a reoccurrence since then. I'm very lucky 
So multiple that, scans since then, you did the surgery, the radiation, and that, mm -hmm. what year would that have been? This is 2009. 2009. So essentially you've been mm -hmm. free, melanoma free since 2009. Well, 2008 was when I had the reoccurrence with my baby. And then it kind of just 2008 was when I did the trial. So we're into 2009 with all the lung and everything. So mm -hmm. I apologize on that date, no, okay. but yeah. And then after the brain surgery, you did the radiation just to make sure the field was clean. No functional deficits having gone through radiation and brain surgery. I have like a little bit of delay in speech. My memory's kind of shot. Like yeah. someone could tell me something and I couldn't remember it at all. So I do have significant memory issues. But from there, the this was in December. So it was like December 7th was that surgery. So it was the very beginning of the holidays. I was looking forward to so many things. But two weeks later, I had significant swelling in my abdomen. It looked like I was four months pregnant. It was very traumatic. I couldn't I had bowel issues. I had all kinds of problems going on. And so we went in for a PET scan. And I had an at the time, it was so wrapped up around like my bowel, they thought at that point that they were telling me, I went to the ER because the pain was severe. And when they did that scan, they were like, okay, well, we need to do an emergency bowel resect. You're going to have a colostomy bag. I mean, I was devastated at this right. point because I had just done the brain surgery. I just felt very defeated. Yeah. I felt like I was never going to win this, that there was no way I was going to recover. I was really depressed at this point. Yeah. But the, my oncologist said, we're not doing that. You need to go home, rest, come and see me next week. And we're going to figure something out. Cause I was crying saying, please don't do this to me. I can't have that. I won't be able to function mentally if I have this glossy bag. And he's like, okay, let's figure something out. Yeah. He was like, I always called him like the mad scientist. He was so smart, so dedicated to me. I mean, I had his phone number and any time I would call, if it was 3 a.m. or 2 p.m., he would answer. He was, the most incredible man who I dedicate most of my survival on him. Yeah. He sounds remarkable. He was incredible. So what did they determine was going on with your bowel and how did that resolve? They ended up doing radiation very long. I think it was like three and a half weeks of radiation. And my doctor, Dr. Vora, he was so thorough, very straight to the point. He would always just be very blunt and honest, but I got so again, so lucky. My The tumor actually came out from behind my bowel, moved on its own from the radiation. So they did determine there was melanoma around the bowel. Yeah. And then this tumor looked like a cantaloupe because now you could literally see it in my uterus at this mm -hmm. point. It came around. And so when they, the radiation actually helped me tremendously. So I ended up having a surgery on that. And that, they went in through my belly button and they were able to pull it out. But unfortunately, I lost my ovaries, fallopian tube on my right side. And I woke up to that. Like, they just told me, I'm really sorry. My, your husband had to make this decision. Yeah. You've lost, it'd be really hard to conceive after this. Like, so I was, woke up to not only the devastation of potentially losing my motherhood it was also the fact that i didn't get to make that decision i wasn't yeah. a part of it so i felt really i was very actually upset yeah. that was made without me but i mean i get it now i yeah. get why it was done 100 percent. right it was not real feasible to wake you up and ask <laughs> yeah exactly that would have been traumatic yeah and that so that was so you had the brain tumor then it showed up in your bowel both were surgically removed you're mm -hmm. still going through different types of chemo or immunotherapy all along yeah yep we we're trying different ones a lot at this point because this is when my story really starts to ramp up from here it was superficial tumors were showing up all the time mm -hmm. everywhere all over my body i would just rub my forehead and there would be like a lump and then i Every night I would just rub my skin and I would find five or six every night. So I was getting covered by these superficial tumors. And so I would try, like, I think I was on like Taxol at that point. 
And I sat in the oncologist waiting room and I was like, I'm not leaving until we find another plan. And he's like, you've only been on it two treatments. And I'm like, no, it's not working. This tumor showing up everywhere. Like I'm going to die. We have to come up with something else. So that's kind of when I first started advocating for myself is I started really standing up for what I felt my body was doing and what I felt like I needed it to do. So I was really trying to tell the doctor, hey, I can feel these. I know what it's doing and it's not reacting in a positive way. Right. We need to do something else. So we tried something else and tried something else and nothing was working. Uh, we removed surgery. We did surgeries in between that. We moved a couple off my spine. We moved some that were causing pain, mm -hmm. basically. So between all this, after all is said and done, I ended up with 14 surgeries total wow. with everything in between the six treatments that I went through. And then I think it was September. I can't maybe I probably don't remember the date, but I do remember going in for an appointment and they were like, cause the tumors were everywhere yeah. and we're trying all these random things. And they're like, sat us down. And this was my second oncologist that was working with me. She was amazing. I love her dearly. She sat us down and she's like, okay, I love you guys, but I need to be honest. We're trying to turn your weeks into months, Katie, like we're out of options. This is going to be, this is it for you. And she kept talking and my husband just like spun up out of his chair, turned around. And he's like, oh, wait, what are you saying? what is happening here? And he just kept in the background. I kept remember him going, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I was like, okay, well, what do you, what are we doing? And he's, he finally gets to grips of what was going on and realizing that I was dying and that I was, there was nothing they could do that. This was the turning point for me. And I accepted it rather well, and which was bizarre for me. I didn't expect myself to be okay with it, but I felt that everybody that was working for me did everything they could. They were incredible, smart. They were constantly fighting for me. And if it, there was nothing we could do, there was not, I mean, what was I to do? Yeah. So she's like, okay, well, you need to get your affairs in order. You need to figure out the plan for the kids. How are you going to tell them? And I just kept remember saying like, how am I supposed to tell a five-year-old that their mom will no longer be here. That's just like a conversation. Nobody should have to you have. Never, yeah, you never expect to have. And I know so many people that have had it. So it's, it really, that is what got me. That's where I felt mad and angry as soon as she said that. She's like, well, what do you want to do, Katie? What? How can I help? And I was like, well, I'm going to take my kids to Disneyland. I'm going to go and celebrate them. I want them to remember it so that's what we did we went to disneyland my husband is so sweet he secretly invited best friends family members we ended up having like 100 people there he was just every day somebody new showed up and it was kind of like a celebration of life sort of in my own way i felt i felt a sense of peace at that point and she was like, your body's going to be really tired. You're, you're not going to make through it. You're going to need a wheelchair. You're going to need all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, okay, sure. She gave me a letter to get a handicap sign to try and a disabled sign. I apologize to help with the walking. And at the very last minute before we were leaving, she was like, okay, I'm going to do what's called target now testing. She's like, it's our Hail Mary. It's the last option we have. I'm going to take two tumors out and I'm going to test them and we're going to see if anything reacts to it. And that's what we did. We did the surgery and I left the next day for Disneyland. She's like, you need to get a wheelchair. Like your body's going to be worn out. You just went through surgery. It was up on my chest right here. So I wasn't too worried about it. Yeah. But we ended up going to Disneyland and my husband gets a wheelchair and I looked at him. And I was like, you better take that away from me right now. I do <laughs> not, not need that. that. Yeah. I'm like, I will not sit in that. And he was very mad at me at that point. Cause he's like, no, you need this. They told you that like you, you're going to get weak. And 
I was like, absolutely not. So I ended up going all day, all through the night without any issues. And that's just kind of the determination I always had. Somebody is going to tell me one thing, but I'm going to prove them wrong. I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to do it better than what you asked me to do. Yeah. And so that's what we did. So it's a beautiful story really. And going into that trip, understanding what is about to happen over the next few months of your life has to be its own kind of terrifying, but it sounds like you were able to find some peace in that, in that resignation, but you had that Hail Mary pass and clearly you're sitting here today. Presumably that then gave you some targeted therapy you were able to try. Yeah, it was temozolamide or temidar. It was kind of the A plus one. It was the one that showed the most promise. So we did that right when I got back. And at this point, I was probably covered. I probably had like 100 tumors all over me. I mean, I was just like, you know, accepting the fact a lot of them were painful on my back, hard to sleep. And so we started that right away. And within that period of time, I started noticing, oh, wait, I apologize. At this point, wait, let me see if I'm getting this next. No, okay, you're right. Okay, so I did the Temidar and I started noticing things started shrinking. Little superficial ones started going away. And it was, okay, well, wait, maybe we're going to get through this. So I did, I think it was four cycles of that. And once that was done, I still had tumors on me, but not half as many as I did before. So now they were like, okay, well, maybe you're, this is going to be a survival story. And so I lived comfortably stable with some melanoma in me. And then I started to just slowly remove anything that was causing any pain. And it was like 2000, I think it was like 2011 when Ipi Mubilab became available by approved by the FDA. They gave me a very small dose of that. And between that and the Temidar, I was... Mm -hmm. it started i it was only i had like two tumors that were very stable that i still i think still have one of them to this day it's just stable it just it's like it didn't do anything it's just Mm -hmm. so i was living with melanoma for a good two years before i ended up being cancer free before they declared me cancer free you said one of them is still there to this day some nodule i believe so I mean, I am due for a PET scan, so I would be interested to see. It's been four years since I've had a PET scan, but yeah, uh, yeah, it was stable. They called me. I was, they just said I was living with melanoma and I was stable for a good two years. Yeah. And then, yeah, I had one reoccurrence after that. I had one that showed up on my chest. We removed that and then they declared me cancer free after that. And are you still taking any immunotherapy to this day? I haven't done treatment since 2000, uh, probably, I think that last IPI was my last one. So 2011 was the last time I did treatment. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So now we're 12 years. Yep. Been, I declare myself cancer free from the date that I had a last, my last melanoma inside me. So like for me, that was the last one they removed. So I say nine years for that, Yeah. but it's been, yeah, 12 years since the diagnosis. Wow. So given that you went through all of that, you learned the ropes of navigating the medical system of really advocating Mm -hmm. for yourself and catching some lucky breaks along the way, having a great support system. And you had a lot of resources that may not be available to everybody. Uh, You know, it sounds like a just incredibly stalwart husband, family that was able to help frequently. Uh, You then you channel that energy. Your fight wasn't over just because it was over for you. You channeled your energy into now becoming a melanoma advocate. Tell me as we're getting to the end, tell me why you made that decision to become a melanoma advocate, Mm -hmm. continue that fight against melanoma. Honestly, it started very slowly and not even realizing I would be what I am to, Mm -hmm. to be quite honest. I just, it was 2019. I started talking about, I didn't, my story in the month of May. I was very, every day I shared something and I just kind of decided that, you know, I want to do this, but I would don't, I want to do it separate from my family. Like I created what my page is now, my melanoma world, because I, I just wanted my story to be out there, whether or not people would hear it. I wasn't sure where it would go. 
but I just started like really connecting with people and people's response to what my story was and how it started helping them. I was just really like, I felt really moved and empowered by that. So I started just slowly becoming closer with a lot of people and learning so much along the way and talking to more people, people creating sunscreen, people are creating UPF clothing. And it just sort of sort of became my passion. And I truly say that with like, everything I, I mm-hmm. truly love what I do, I put everything I have into it. It's kind of I kind of feel like it's my job. I feel like I I'm supposed to be doing this. And I'm very proud to be able to help and share other people's stories. It's just really become the best part of me. Mm. And it's healed me in a lot of ways, honestly. Yeah, I can understand that. And I know it's been a big help to so many people and appreciate from as a doctor's perspective, somebody else out there providing that education because it's a different way to get that information and people learn in different ways and Mm -hmm. find reassurance and hope from different sources. And yeah. as doctors, we maybe sometimes can make this feel too routine because we see it all the time. But for that person, it's the first time they're going through it. And to find yeah. somebody that can be an advocate for them and help educate them on the process is very hopeful. You know, looking at everything that you've gone through, if we can imagine somebody just got off the phone with their dermatologist and they were told they have melanoma that they're going to need additional surgery. There's a million thoughts running through their head. What would you like to tell that person that just got off the phone with their dermatologist? Something I kind of tried to do is try to turn their perspective into more of a positive thing and just say like, it's really great that they're getting this out because if they don't get it out, this could spiral into something bigger. So try and think of it as, great, this is it, I'm going to take this out. And I'm going to be, I'm going to learn from this, I'm Mm going to change my habits, I'm going to become stronger and tell people from my experience. So I tried to get them to kind of see what an advocate is, and how that not only helps them, but helps their family, their best friend, their coworker. And it's really, I think helped people, a lot of people are just like, Oh, I've never thought of it that way. Or Thank you for that perspective. So I'd really just try to think of what somebody, when I was alone and there was no social media, what someone could have done for me, just mm-hmm. held my hand, encourage them, be there for them is the number one thing. Making them feel not alone is like everything. Yeah. Feeling not it alone truly is so is. important. Yeah, Uh, We'll certainly share your social media handles with the show notes uh, on the podcast and the video description. What are the most important things people can do from a preventative standpoint? Because your advocacy has not only been for people who are living with melanoma, Mm -hmm. hopefully trying to prevent other people from ever having to go through it. What kind of message would you like to share regarding melanoma prevention or skin cancer prevention in general? Skin cancer prevention is it's such a huge battle, I feel like, because there's such a stigma with it about the whole, well, it can't happen to me, or it's just skin cancer, or I'll just cut it off all the things that is covered with skin cancer. So I think mostly, I just think that if you can start by just getting to the dermatologist, seeing someone like yourself, 100%, just start there, see where you see where it goes from there. Because if you're not initially starting with a skin check, I feel like you're not going to implement the sunscreen and the the UPF clothing because Mm -hmm. starting with a skin check is basically where you're going to get kickstarted of either getting something removed or not. But that dermatologist is going to tell you, hey, you're fair skinned, go over the things that they should be doing to take care of it. But that person, the dermatologist is, I feel like the most important role to get someone to start taking care of theirs. And someone like yourself probably knows that, like you have to really get that person to see the importance. Yeah. I echo that, get in, see your dermatologist, get a baseline screening exam, get in that habit of wearing sunscreen, sun protective clothing, know your family history, understand your risks. Yeah. Um, 
don't go get yourself sunburned or seek to get a tan. We know that sun exposure happens as part of an active life, which keeps you healthy, but you can mitigate a lot of that risk by just taking certain protective measures. Yeah. I mean, I have a 20 year old and we battle when it comes to laying out. I mm -hmm. mean, she is, she knows my story. She knows everything I've gone through, but her and I battle because she loves the sun. She loves the idea of laying out and getting that golden it brown. It feels thing. good. Yeah. So it is a challenge and I still don't really have a great answer to how to stop that or how to get people to see, but I'm working on, I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out how that's going to impact. But if you can just touch one person and that one person can tell the other person, I mean, you're starting something great. Yeah. A hundred percent. Katie, I can't thank you enough for sharing your vulnerable story. And I'm so glad that you're here to share that story and help other people thank you. and just continue to fight that you are not only for yourself, but on behalf of so many people who have benefited and will yet benefit from your advice. And just, I just got to express my gratitude for taking the time to share such an amazing story. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I just love what you do. I've always been so like amazed at the stuff that you do and the way you've come up with getting people to take care of their skin. So it's been an honor to talk to you. And I just want to say people, advocate for yourself. If your insurance says no, that doesn't mean it's the end. Get yourself to the skin check. Start with the SPF that you love, that you're going to wear uh, and find some UPF clothing and just learn what it's like to take care of your skin and your skin will take care yeah. of you. Yeah. Yeah. Your insurance company doesn't necessarily get the final word on things. Talk to your yes. doctor. We want to help. We dislike your insurance company as much as you do. <laughs> we want to get yes. you through treatment and help you live a thriving. With that, we'll close things up and thank you for your yeah. time. And I'm sure that we'll have lots of additional conversations online. And yeah. you know, I want to keep supporting the mission that you're on. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for listening to the Health IQ podcast. Please remember that this podcast is intended for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or any other health profession. The contents of this podcast should not be considered as medical advice and no doctor-patient relationship is formed. If you have any medical conditions, you should seek the care of a qualified medical professional in your area for diagnosis or treatment.